Stand up with the fear of God. Let us listen to the Holy Gospel, chapter from the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew. May his blessing be with us. Amen. From the Psalms of our teacher David, the prophet and the king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. I have diligently sought your face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Do not turn your face away from me. Be my helper and do not forsake me. And, O oh God, my Savior, do not overlook me. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our God and Savior, King of us all, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, to whom is the glory forever and ever and ever amen then jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward he was hungry now when the tempter came to him he said if you are the son of god command that these stones become bread but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of, the, of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all the things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Glory be to God for ever. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today we enter the second Sunday of Great Lent. The last two weeks, we've made up our minds. We said that we're going to strive towards a heavenly life on earth. We give up things. We give up things like food, things that cause us to stray, things that cause us to be distracted, and we put our minds towards heaven. And the gospel reading from today comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And it recounts our Lord's temptation by Satan after fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, beginning his ministry. And as we move through Lent, we have to meditate on this passage in order to learn from this great example of our Lord so that we are continually aware of the schemes of the devil who is constantly trying to fight against us. So what are some lessons that we can learn from our Lord's temptation? Well, first, after being baptized after the chrismation by St. John <clears throat> in the Jordan, he is led by the Spirit. This is in verse 1. It is our our baptism and our chrismation that unites us with Christ. It's the chrismation that allows us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so from that point forward, the Spirit leads us, guides us. Some may say, I don't feel like God's Spirit is leading and guiding me in my life. Sometimes I even feel abandoned. Well, this is why we must renew our chrismation some call it our personal Pentecost, every time that we come to liturgy. Every time we come to liturgy, the priest prays that God sends his Holy Spirit upon the gifts of the bread and the wine to change it into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, we pray that he sends the same Spirit upon each one of us, that the Holy Spirit of God can descend on each one of us every single day in prayer, every single time we come to liturgy. But we must pray and ask for God's Spirit. We must request this. God doesn't leave us to fend for ourselves. He provides the Spirit 
to guide us, to lead us on the path of his will. Second, we said that our Lord's Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. Okay, so where did the Spirit lead Jesus? He was led into the wilderness, which is a symbol for the world's battleground. It's a, there's a beautiful connection that can be made uh, when St. Paul describes the, the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 about uh, fighting the forces of evil. And so being baptized, being chrismated, worshiping in church, receiving the Eucharist, praying daily is no guarantee of living an easy life. Christianity does not promise this. In fact, it may be the opposite. And the reality is the more we are dedicated and we, we give our hearts to God, the more spiritual battles that we are going to have to fight. No one, no one, no matter how holy they are, is free from this temptation, from these fights. Our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted. This is why we pray daily and multiple times a day in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But most of the time we're tempted because of our own weaknesses and our own decisions, our own sin, our own choices in life. But let's put that off to the side for a second. What if we're not facing the devil because of your sins? What if you're not facing difficulty and challenges and trials and temptations in the wilderness because of something that you have done wrong? Well, you have to ask, why? Why? If I've been so faithful to God, if I'm a good Christian, if I walk in the Spirit of God, why would the Holy Spirit lead me into temptation? Why would the Holy Spirit intentionally put me in a situation where I feel alone? I feel like I'm in the, out in the middle of nowhere being tempted by the devil. There's a few reasons. First and foremost, simply put, it's a test. And God has every right to test us. He already knows what's in our hearts, but many times we don't. Many times we don't understand what's in our own hearts. And as a matter of fact, the people around us, our families, our friends, they don't know what's in our heart either. They don't have that right. We may see somebody who seems very pious, very holy, very righteous, on the, on good on the outside, externally, but we've never seen them when they're in trouble, when they're facing challenges, how they lose their temper, how they cuss, how they're mean to everybody around them, on edge with everybody around them. They lose all patience. How things of God suddenly don't become very important to them anymore because they only want to focus on solving this problem, this trouble. And then on the flip side, you see other people that may strike you as quiet and meek and maybe weak. And you tell yourself, now, that person, if that person ever faces anything challenging in life, man, they're going to crumble. There's no way that person can stand up to anything. And yet, when thrown in the heat of, of adversity, that quiet and meek person that you've never suspected has this inner strength that only God can see. This is very clear in Scripture. Remember Esther, that little girl. She's just a girl. There's no way that she would risk her life to stand up in, in the face of danger of execution by standing up to the king of Persia. But she did. She fasted and she prayed for three days. And risking her own life, she went in front of the king, laid everything on the line to risk her life so that Salvation can come to God's people. We think of the three holy youth. The three holy youth. These young men, they even faced the, the threats of the king, the threats of torture, the threats of death, and they would not bow their knee to the pagan god. It's amazing. God can see into their hearts, but we can't see what's in each other's hearts. The angels and devils they cannot see the depths of the hearts. It's through testing that we understand the wheat is separated from the chaff and the silver and gold are purified and the impurities are burnt away. 
It's through fire that we are revealed what we're really made of. If you're gold, if you're silver, precious stones, the, pure, the fire purifies you. And it makes the heat and the light from the fire, it makes you shine. It only makes you look better, more glorious. But if you're made of kindling, if you're made of wood, hay, and straw, and when the fire comes, it burns you to a, sc- a crisp. We may not know the difference between the two, except the difference comes through fire. In this life, in this world, all of us are continually being tested, all the time. If there is anything within you that's stubble, that's straw or chaff, the fire comes and burns it away, and by the mercy of God, may he grant that you are not chaff, that we're not all stubble, but that in your heart that you're gold, that you are silver and precious stones. In other words, that you have a heart that's truly dedicated to God. If that's the case, then there's no amount of temptation, no amount of testing, no amount of fire that can destroy you. We have to remember this in the face of trials. Sure, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. There's no doubt about it. But when the silver goes to the fire, it doesn't come out destroyed. It comes out purified. It comes out purified. I once heard a story about how is it that the silversmith purifies the silver. He heats it up in the fire, heats it up very, very, very hot, and then the impurities come to the top as a scum. And then the smith clears off the scum from there, from the top. And what's left is that the silver is more pure. Then he does it again. He heats it up a second time, and he heats it up at a very, 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 very difficult, high, high temperature. And again, the scum comes to the top of the silver, and then he takes it off from there. And now what happens to the silver? It's even more pure. And he does that three times. He does that four times, five times, six times. Do you know how the silversmith knows that his job is done? That all the scum is gone. That all the impurities are gone. And what's left is a perfectly pure silver. The silversmith knows that it's ready whenever he looks down into into the into the fire and he looks at the silver and it's so pure and so clear that he can see his own reflection in that molten silver as you are tired and tried being put in the fire as you are literally being melted down so that the impurities can be burned off from you to the point which God knows that his job is done is when God can look down at you and see his own reflection. When he can see his own face in you, that's when he knows it's been truly done. So, Abuna, that sounds, that sounds nice, but it sounds very difficult. H- how do we stand up to this kind of testing? Fasting. Fasting is necessary. It's not an option. This is the second week of the fast. Fasting is necessary. It's necessary for spiritual growth. It's through fasting that our Lord shows us the most powerful tool to do battle against the devil and temptation. It's one of the most powerful tools. I'm not going to speak too much on fasting today because we spoke at it at length a couple of weeks ago as we were entering the fast in the first place. How else did our Lord stand up to the testing? So if we're paying attention to the gospel today that comes from Matthew chapter 4, we notice that our Lord answered every single temptation through Scripture. Every single temptation he answered with Scripture. The Spirit is also leading us to look into Scripture for strength. We look for scripture for guidance. We look for scripture for answers to the questions that are the most puzzling in our lives. 
Our Lord's answers to the devil's first temptation is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of proceeds from the mouth of God. This is he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. We Orthodox Christians believe that the law, the prophets, the gospels, the epistles, the saints, the church fathers, the councils, these are all words of God that guide our life. Our Lord's answer to the third temptation was, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Again, quoting from Scripture. Every choice that we make, every word that we speak, every action that we take, demonstrates who we worship and serve. Do we worship God? Is he first in our life? We need to know the Scripture. We need to study the Scripture. We need to know what has been written by the saints. We need to know what was decided in the councils. We need to know the teachings of the scripture, the teachings of the church in our hearts, because we don't know the moment the devil will turn up and start to tempt us. We can't say, oh, next week I have an appointment with the devil, and so I should study for the next week my scripture so that I'm going to be ready for the devil when he comes. No way. We have to always be ready. We have to know the scripture in our hearts so that we can be ready to respond to the devil. We have to be prepared. And so it is. Do we live uh, a lazy life? I'm speaking on, on myself. In front of our TVs, watching Netflix, trying to be entertained all the time, in front of our devices all the time. Are we just... Always our mind is on going out, being with our friends, being with the people that are around us, video games and things like that. Do we just constantly worry and think about entertainment? If we do that, you know, do we really think that the day that the devil comes to tempt us, that we're going to have the strong muscles and ready to go stand up against the enemy? Are we going to be ready? No. If, if all we seek is pleasure and entertainment in this life, then when the devil shows up, we're going to be too out of shape. I'm speaking on myself. We're going to be too out of shape. Our Lord has already prepared through fasting and through prayer, through years of studying the scripture, and our Lord knew what scripture says so that the moment the devil comes and tempts us with a lie, he could identify it immediately and call it out. You know, something else you notice when you, when you reflect on this amazing passage, really. The devil himself quotes scripture. The devil quotes scripture. He said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. So the devil quoting and sure enough, it is scripture. If you look at what the devil says in scripture, then you go to look at the psalm that he's quoting from. Sure enough, he quoted it correctly. Now, if he didn't know the scripture, if we were trying to avoid scripture at all costs, you might be thrown for a loop right now. That might be scandalous for me to say that. You might say, you know, I'm going to really fight against the devil. And then the devil is quoting scripture to me. It's like, well, I guess if the scripture says that, it must be right. And, and we go in turmoil. He's quoting the scripture. Another reason why you have to know the Bible backwards and forwards is because whenever the devil or devils um, come quoting scripture, Sometimes they're very selective about the quote that they're using and take it out of context. But if you know the full context of what's been quoting, you know the whole story, you know how it all connects together, you're going to be able to identify the lie. Here's a good example. The quote that comes from, it comes from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. It says in verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in verse 12, 
In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Nothing wrong with that. But the devil stops there. He stops quoting there. And in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with just quoting a piece of scripture. You can't quote the whole Bible from cover to cover every time that you open your mouth. That's not reasonable. That's not what we're saying. But if you're not familiar with the psalm, you're going to say, well, man, if the, if the devil quoted from it, then what's wrong? What's, what's wrong with him asking our Lord Jesus to do that? It's very interesting that the devil did not quote the next verse. Verse 13. I'll, I'll repeat verse 12. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And the very next verse in, in the psalm says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Who is the lion that goes around prowling, seeking whom he may devour? If you remember from St. Peter in the first epistle, chapter 5, he says, The devil goes around, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Who is the adder? Who is the snake? Who is the serpent? The devil, the liar, the tempter. Who is the dragon? In the book of Revelation, who is the dragon? It's the devil. So here in one verse, in verse 13, the next verse that he stopped from, we have three different animals mentioned. All three are representative of, of Satan, the devil himself. And the devil is the lion, the adder, the dragon, according to this verse. And Christ and his followers were tread on him under our feet. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil so that he might be tested and tried. But just like a father who encourages his son to go into a race or to compete, just like a parent who encourages their child to compete in some kind of sport, they don't, incur they don't do that so they can lose. No, we encourage them so that they can be victorious and they can win. That's why God sends us into testing and trials. He is our loving father. He is there cheering us on, comforting us, giving us strength. If you could see God right now, I imagine that he's looking down from heaven saying, that's my boy. I'm so proud of them. God loves us. We are his kids. He didn't send you into the race so that you would be defeated. He sent you so that you can cross the finish line so that you can have the ribbon behind you. He sent you to win. This is the opportunity to win, to win the race, to beat the devil. Don't let this Lent pass us by, that we just keep it as any normal day, that these days go by quickly. God has given us the opportunity to give glory to him. Would you rather, rather say to God, Oh, I don't really want to be victorious. I'm good. I really don't want to win. So I'd rather not be in the race at all. No. God wants you to know what it feels like to cross that finish line victoriously. God wants you to know what it feels like to run the race and win. He sends you into those temptations so that you might crush the devil. It's a time for testing. Opportunity to give glory to God. You see, that was not the last time that the devil tempted our Lord Jesus Christ and attacked him. No, it was going to get worse. He took him to the cross. Do you think that if you indulge yourself in food your whole life without fasting, if you indulge yourself with pleasures at all times, without worship, without prayer, daily prayer, daily scripture, if you let your spiritual muscles get flabby for weeks and months and years, and then it comes time when somebody challenges you that you either deny Christ or die, do you think we're going to have what it takes to be a martyr for Christ? Do you think we're going to have what it takes to be able to repel the temptations that the devil sends your way? Do you think you're going to have what it takes to win the whole battle if you, we don't prepare? 
St. Isaac the Syrian said, This life has been given to you for the sake of repentance. Do not waste it on vain pursuits. Do not waste it on vain pursuits. The devil wants to distract us. He wants to make us lazy, to be a coward, to be self-centered. The Holy Spirit is calling us to fight. He's calling us to fast and to pray and to resist temptation and to be spiritually mature. So, to conclude, as we follow the footsteps of Christ during this journey of Lent, he will call you to pray. He will call you to fast. He will call you to, to worship, to study the scriptures. He calls us to learn the teachings of the church. He calls us to give, to give our money, to give our time, to give our hearts, to help those who are in need. If you are faithfully doing all these things, your spiritual muscles will get stronger and stronger. And then when the fiercest onslaught comes at our ways, and the enemy comes into our life, whatever time that may be, maybe it's 20 years from now, you will be strong enough by the grace of God to stand in front of it and to be victorious. Those are the reasons why the Holy Spirit at times will lead us into the wilderness for temptation, is so that we are tested, so that we may give the opportunity to glorify God and to be victorious, to win. And it's for further preparation so that our spiritual muscles might be strengthened, so that we're ready. We learn from our Lord's powerful example that in order to, come to fight the devil, we have to cling closely to the Bible. It's not optional. Christ used scripture it to fight every fight, every temptation. And he shows us that we're in need of the scripture to remind us that he has given us the authority and the ability to defeat the devil. If the Bible is not close to our hearts, unfortunately, we're not even aware of the strength that it comes from. We're not even aware of the promises. And so we feel like we're hopeless. Let us pray during this Lenten time that God helps us cling close to the scripture to remind us of his everlasting and true promises and to give us the wisdom and discernment to battle all the efforts of the devil. And glory be to God forever. Amen.